Good morning, everybody. We're going to get started as you're coming in from the fellowship hall or the uh, foyer. Hello. <laughs> They're just jabbering away. <laughs> We're going to get started. If you'd stand with me, please. As you do so, I want to welcome those of you who are an online family. Glad to have you with us today on this Father's Day. Uh, as always, if you have a prayer request or a praise report that you would like us to share with the congregation, please just uh, send it to my text, uh, text to my cell phone. That number is showing up on your screen. I also want to make sure that I give a special shout out to a dear friend of 30 years, a dear lady, Sister Effie Bennett. We are so thankful to have you in our service. Amen. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. How awesome is the Lord Most High, the great King over all the earth. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. You believe that? Amen. It's what stops fear. It's what stops anxiety. It's what stops discouragement. God reigns as king. Lord, as we come together today to worship, we not only honor you as king, we also thank you that you're our father by faith in Jesus Christ. That we have a good, good father who so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We pray, Lord, that you would grace us with your presence. We want it to be more than just people gathering together in a building. We want your family gathering together with Papa, Abba, Father today, and that your, your glory would be here. Your glory, Lord. Your spirit would work in this place to accomplish your purpose. Lord, you already have a, a design for this service. We don't want to get ahead of it or lag behind it, but stay in step. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a place where I love to run and play. There's a place that I sing you songs of praise. Dancing with my Father God in fields of praise. Dancing with my Father God in fields of praise. There's a place that I lose myself within. There's a place that I find myself again. Dancing with my father God in fields of praise. Dancing with my father. There's a place where religion finally dies. There's a place that I lose my selfish pride. Dancing with my Father God in fields of praise. Dancing with my Father God in fields of praise. Father sings over me. 
is a place where religion finally died. There's a place that I lose my selfish pride. I'm dancing with my Father God in fields of grace. I'm dancing with my Father God in fields of grace. Come dance with my Father God in fields of grace. I'm dancing with my Father God in fields of grace. Amen. His one and only Son to save us for God so loved the world that He gave us. His one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in Him will live forever. Oh, the power of hell forever defeated. Now it is well. I'm walking in freedom for God so loved, God so loved the world. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, 
Come lay them down to the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. Amen.
We'll sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name. your name. You are the good, good father.
perfect in all your
trust your grace. Oh, You are perfect in all of your ways. 
you are a good, good father. Perfect in all of your ways. So loving the world that you gave your son. Paying the ransom that we could never pay to make us part of your family, to restore the broken relationship that we caused by sin. A relationship that on our own we could never restore, no matter how hard we tried. Our fig leaves were never going to cover us. It took your covering. It took the blood of your son for our redemption to be complete, to be bought back from the slavery of sin. Open our eyes, Lord, to see more and more the love of the Father for us, your children. That the ground of our lives is that relationship through Christ that we have with you, a secure and firm foundation in the love of the Father. Accomplish your purpose, Lord, through the remainder of this service. May this Father's Day be memorable because of an encounter with you here as the gathered people of God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. So, oh, I guess I should probably be in front of this, not behind it, probably. All right. So what, to all the kids in here, what do you like to do with your dad? Today's Father's Day, so we're going to talk about it. What do you like doing with your dad? Riding his motorcycle. Bruce is not making eye contact. <laughs> Anyone else? Fixing stuff. What do you like to fix with him? When he's working on what? Working in the shop. Okay. Helping dad build stuff. All right, that's a good start. I, um, now, question for you. Could you do any of that stuff by yourself? Could you ride his motorcycle by yourself? Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> Caleb, could you, could you work in the shop and do what he does by yourself? Could you uh, build stuff by yourself? Like, as impressive as you could with him? So, God has given us our earthly dads to kind of show how he operates as our heavenly father. You know what I mean? So, our earthly fathers can empower us, they can build us up, they can help us grow in our gifts and help us discover what we like and what we don't like. And our heavenly father can show us what our gifts are for his kingdom, because that's ultimately what the goal is. It's to use our gifts and uh, uh, operate in the empowerment that he has given us by our Holy Spirit to grow the kingdom of God. Now, not everybody is fortunate enough to have a good earthly father. And sometimes their view of God gets messed up because, well, the earthly father failed me, so how can I trust the heavenly father? And that's what Pastor Ray is going to talk about today. We're going to talk about what to do and how God is going to be that perfect heavenly father and say, even though he has failed you, I will not. I love you. I see you. I will be your shield. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my dad. If you'd please open your Bibles to the Epistle of Romans, chapter 8. Romans, chapter 8. And once you find it, if you'd stand with me, we want to read a portion of this text. I want to read verses 12 through 17. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it's not to the sinful nature to live according to it. 
For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you'll live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you have received the spirit of sonship or the spirit of adoption. And by him we cry, Abba, or Papa, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are God's children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs or joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. O oh God, because of what you have done for us through Jesus Christ, your Son, we are no longer orphans. We are children of the living God, of our Heavenly Father, by faith. And I pray that the truth, that reality that the Scripture speaks of, would permeate our beings today. And that if there's anyone who is taking part in this service in the sanctuary or online, that today they would know through faith in Jesus Christ, they are orphans no more. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. It's good to see everybody. I won't be seeing you for the next couple of weeks. Pastor Mark's going to be preaching. My lovely bride and I are taking a little bit of time away, getting out of Dodge, so to speak. And so if you have a need while we're gone, please feel free to contact one of the elders, and they'll be able to help you and take care of you. But it is good to see you. Charles Dickens. Anyone ever read some of Dickens' novels? Familiar with them? He's a noted, he was, a noted English author during the Victorian period of England. That would be the 1800s. And he wrote a number of novels, and some of them were critiques of the culture in which he lived. He was a Victorian age, but there was such a gap between the very, very wealthy and the very, very poor. And so he, he wrote some of his novels to address that. And he also wrote novels that focused on redemption where you move from a place that wasn't good to a positive place. So some of his works that you may be familiar with, A Tale of Two Cities, David Copperfield, um, Christmas Carol, and uh, Oliver Twist. Now the redemption theme shows up in the Christmas Carol. You got Scrooge, this miserly man who by the end knows how to celebrate Christmas well. Well, in Oliver Twist, <clears throat> it traces the story of a little poor orphan named Oliver and the incredibly difficult trials and sufferings that he had to go through. But by the end of the novel, he gets adopted by Mr. Brownlow, I believe it is, and lives happily ever after. We like those kinds of stories, those feel-good, end-well stories. It's like the orphan Annie. You know, where she starts off as this orphan, but by the end she's adopted by Oliver Warbucks, and richest man in New York City. We love stories that have those kind of happy endings. It's not so much the characters, because what if you had the same characters, but the plot line was reversed, and everybody started as a great family, and at the end of the story, you had little orphan Annie, and you had Oliver in the working house, the poor house. You're like, well, that was not very satisfying ending. I mean, wouldn't that be depressing? Like, oh, everything's great. Everything stinks. Okay, the end. We like the orphan finds a family. We like the rags to riches. We like a feel-good ending. Today, I want to look with you. Oh, thank you so much. It's allergy season. I'm going to drink it this time. Watch this. See, see. Although that may be the last time I do. But <clears throat> I want to look at another orphan story today with you. A story that is, in my opinion, more powerful than Oliver's, more powerful than Annie's. It's an orphan story that begins in Ephesians 2, but ends in our text in Romans 8. So in Ephesians 2, you can follow along behind me. 
Here's how Paul describes our plight. Pre-Jesus. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. That's not a very good place to be. That's a place of a spiritual orphan, alienated, poverty. Paul isn't done, though. In verse 11, he goes, Remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. You were orphans. You and I were destitute orphans prior to Christ. We had nothing. We were separated from God. There was no family. There were no connections. There was no acceptance. There was no accepted in the beloved. There's nothing for us. Far worse than Oliver in the working house. Far worse than little orphan Annie. Our plight was headed for destruction. But then God. But then God the Father acted. He acted and stepped into time and space as that song we sang, for God so loved the world that he gave, his only son, that's John 3, 16, to music. That God acted through Jesus Christ to make a way to bring us back into the family. Our text says, you did not receive the spirit of uh, slavery again to fear. You've received the spirit of adoption, the spirit of sonship. By him we cry, Abba, Father. I've <clears throat> described that word Abba before. That is the most intimate way a little child would address their dad. This wasn't Father. It was Daddy. Daddy. Imagine that God, the Almighty King, restores us to the point that we can call God Daddy. Daddy. John says in his gospel, that to those who believed on Jesus, we got the right to be called the children of God. John says in John 3, 1 John 3, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that's what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That's what God did for us. That's what we just sang about. All those songs about the Father, dancing with the Father in fields of grace. God so loved the world. Good, good. Father is what God the Father has done for us. This past Wednesday, in our Facebook Live word of encouragement, I talked about that as children of the Heavenly Father, we've received the Father's blessing. I shared a story how when I was growing up, and you know the story that for the first half of my childhood, my father was uh, not a follower of Jesus Christ. He was a churchgoer. We'd go to church every single Sunday. And during the warm summer months when there was one service, we'd walk to church from our house. And on the way back, we'd always stop at a place called Bowman's. They had penny candy. Candy for a penny. Some of you remember that. I'm not sure. Some of the stuff we used to, to, to eat, though, because they had candy that looked like cigarettes. This was 60s. They had those little dots that they glued to paper. So you're, you're trying to get the paper off your mouth. But my dad would drink. He was a functional alcoholic. And if he wasn't home by 5'10", on Friday, I knew where he was. He had left his office, walked next door to the stagecoach inn. And if it was a stressful week, he'd do the same thing on Thursday and Friday. He'd work all week, go back to work, be drunk. But then my father had an encounter with Jesus Christ that changed his life. 
At 56 years of age, my father got saved. He got royally saved. He would get up at 4, 4.30 in the morning to read through his Bible. And after reading it through a few times, decided to read through Matthew Henry's commentary on the Bible. The unabridged one, you know. It just, he was just so hungry for the Word of God. So that when I ended up at 20 years of age preaching my first sermon for our home church, I was going pre-med when I went to college because God wanted me to be a pastor and I was fighting him on that. But I ended up becoming an interim youth pastor in Tulsa, ended up coming home, preached to my home church. My father came up to me. Now my dad never cried. He just, that generation, men don't cry. But he had a little tear right in the corner of his eye took my hand. He said, son, you have my blessing to be a pastor. Up to that point, he wanted me to be a doctor or a lawyer, but he gave me the father's blessing. And I shared on Wednesday that not everybody has had that privilege of having a father's blessing, maybe on an earthly level. But every one of us who are in Jesus Christ have been given the father's blessing because he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus Ephesians 1, 3. You did not miss out on the Father's blessing if you are a child of God. Our text tells us that we are heirs of God, co-heirs or joint heirs with Christ if we share in his sufferings in order that we also share in his glory. In Ephesians 1, the Apostle Paul lays out for us blessing after blessing after blessing that's ours. We've been accepted in the beloved. We've been chosen. We've been predestined. We've been adopted. We've been sealed. We've been redeemed. All of these incredible blessings that are ours through Jesus Christ because of our relationship with Christ that we are now children of the Father. We are not orphans. Orphans no longer. Now, I could stop the sermon here and cause Bruce DeLate to pass out because it's shorter than the one at St. Christopher's. I could invite the worship team to come on down and we could sing, Good, Good Father, and you can be out of here very early. But the Lord impressed upon me that we have to go deeper. Not that what I said isn't true, but here's the dilemma. I've been a pastor or pastoring for almost 40 years, all the ministry combined. And in my own pilgrimage for the first half of it, plus as a pastor of the flock of God for all these years, what I've come to realize is that often there's a gulf between what we know and what we feel. That theologically we could pass an exam and even maybe quote John 3.16 or the passage from Romans chapter 8 that you would be able successfully to ace the exam. And as long as things are going well and you feel like you're meeting the grade, you could sing, he's a good, good father, perfect in all his ways. But once you don't meet the grade or once things start turning a little sour in your life, it's almost as if that default back to the orphan heart becomes our way of life again. The gulf between what we know and what we feel. And yet, the uh, concept of God as Father and our relationship to Him as His children <clears throat> and our new identity, our new standing, our new position in him is absolutely foundational to a healthy, vibrant Christian life. When you have believers who are not secure in that relationship with God, we call it an insecure bond, where they're just not sure. Intellectually, that's fine, but experientially and in the heart, they wonder, am I really secure in this bond? Am I really the child of God? That without that concept, without that foundation, everything those believers try to build will be unstable and shaky and vulnerable. Their works will sometimes alternate between doing it out of glory for God and doing it to be acceptable to God. 
They're living with an orphan heart. They're spiritual orphans. And so therefore, we've got to take some time to explore just what is this orphan heart? Where does it come from? But more importantly, how does God heal the orphan heart? Because the Christian life, this vibrant that we sang about, the peace, we draw near, we do faith, all of that is conditioned upon what God did through Jesus Christ. And so it has to be solid. So earlier in the week, the Lord laid on my, on my heart that phrase, an orphan no more. So let's take a look in the back of your bulletin. There's a place if you want to write down some of the characteristics of an orphan heart. I want to look at these with you. I don't know if they're going to come up one at a time or how that's going to, oh, they came up all at once. Okay. We'll just give you a chance to write them down then. First one is this. How do you tell if you have an orphan heart? You strive to be accepted and belong, but doubt that you ever will. Orphans have no family, and orphans want so desperately to be accepted and belong. They want so desperately to be part of the family. But as days pass and weeks pass and even months pass, orphans begin to wonder if they ever will be chosen if they will ever be wanted and adopted, if they'll ever be welcomed into the home. Spiritual orphans feel the same way. They strive so hard to be accepted. They strive so hard to belong. But they doubt they ever will feel like they are part of the family. That's because orphans view themselves as on the outside looking in. They're like the child that's outside looking through the big window and they see the beautiful turkey and all the trimmings at Thanksgiving and they see the smiles and the laughter and they're standing outside and it's snowing on them. They're cold. They're wet. They're alone. It seems as if everybody else is enjoying the family. They could sit in a congregation of a hundred people and be with all of these people and look at everyone around them and think, well, they're in, I'm not. I just don't have what they have. I'm, I'm outside looking in. Orphans come to believe that they have to take care of themselves because nobody else will. Orphans believe that they have to take care of themselves because nobody else will. They have to protect themselves. They have to watch out for themselves. Nobody else does. They have to do whatever they need to to survive. Orphans are scared to get too close to others. It's, it's ironic. They so desperately want a relationship with other people, but they're afraid of being rejected, being hurt and neglected. And so therefore, they don't get too close. They keep people at arm's length. They don't want to be vulnerable. Because see, an orphan feels as if they're not good enough. And so therefore, for an orphan, they're afraid to let down their guard. Because if you see them for who they really are, you could reject them. Or you could harm them. So orphans are always in that protect mode. Always saying, okay, so close, but not any closer. You can't know the real me. They, they have a, a mask on. They put up the protectors. It's almost like they had the plexus shields before the pandemic came. Don't get too close. They wear masks. Don't get too close. But at the same time, they wish they could. Orphans assume that love is conditional and needs to be earned. That's why spiritual orphans are constantly trying to do enough to get God to love them. If I just read the Bible more, if I just pray more, if I just fast more, if I just go to the church more, if I just evangelize more, if I just give more, it's always more than what I'm doing. I'm never enough. I always have to keep striving to get more, and then, just maybe, I'll be acceptable. But, if I'm accepted, I have to keep striving. Because if I let it down at all, I'm not going to make it. It's a conditional love, not unconditional. Spiritual orphans would rather have rules, now they don't have it up here yet, but 
spiritual orphans would rather have rules than relationships. For orphans, relationships make them uncomfortable. Even though they long for it, they're unpredictable. And therefore, they'd rather have rigid rules that they can follow. She's coming back. She's opening the door. She's moving to the next slide. Even as we click, there she is. All right. We're getting adapted to this. So, so spiritual orphans tend to lean towards more of a legalistic way of life. They like the rigid rules because they can control the rules. They like to control rules. They like to control things. They like to control people. They like, why? Because if they control everything, they won't be hurt. They won't be rejected. It's safer to have rules. They don't know how to dance in fields of grace. They want the rules to tell them I'm okay. And they'll gravitate to people that will tell them what to do, the rules. Spiritual orphans perceive that everybody is a competitor for what they believe is the available limited love and acceptance. For spiritual orphans, life is like a pie. There's only so many pieces. And if I don't grab my piece, I'm going to starve. So everybody is seen as a threat to the limited love that's out there. Spiritual orphans are critical of themselves. I just realized here, I'm counting, there should be nine, not ten. I skipped one. It's okay, but it'll work. Orphans, orphans are very critical of themselves and others. Spiritual orphans never feel like they measure up, so they're constantly beating themselves up but they're also finding fault in everybody else around them too. And finally, spiritual orphans live in fear rather than in grace, which leads them to withdraw or lash out whenever they fail or feel shame. Spiritual orphans don't know how to live in fields of grace. They're constantly afraid of being exposed, of failing, and so they don't know what to do with that, that, those emotions. So what they do is, is they'll either pull away, flight, or they'll lash out and attack the person that they feel is causing them to feel the shame. These are nine indicators of an orphan heart. An orphan heart. Orphans in the natural, but orphans in the spiritual. And, and it's... It, I know that for the first half of my Christian life, that's how I lived. I, I loved God and I wanted to serve him, but I never quite felt good enough to be acceptable. So this isn't just theory for me. I, I know what this is like. What causes it? I mean, we could look at a whole bunch of causes. We could say maybe it's just somebody never studied the word of God. They just don't know that he's a good, good father. They, they don't get the fact that he, he really has loved them. Maybe it's just ignorance that they just don't know what the Father's done. And that's true. Except in my case, being a Bible quizzer, I had memorized thousands of Bible verses. I knew what the Word of God said. I could quote it. But it's still, there was a gap between here and here. Sometimes it can come about because of, uh, as Ben was saying, poor uh, role models in the home. You know, our fathers aren't perfect fathers. My dad's alcoholism for the first nine years of my life, ten years of my life, certainly affected me. And so what we do is we take what we see and we project it on the one we don't see. And we assume that if this is what our earthly dad was like, that's what our heavenly dad's like. I know that was for me. I remember my dad cutting my brother out of the picture. Just cut him off. My brother had done something and that was it. My dad wasn't going to talk to him. Cut him out of the will. He didn't exist. And my dad, in one of his drunken rages, reaches for his belt and starts screaming and yelling like he's going to nail me. Whew. Trust me, you start to see the Heavenly Father like that as well. He's just waiting. Just waiting for you to blow it so he could pull off his belt and whip the snot out of you. Sometimes that's what caused it. But really, when you get right down to it, ultimately, the spiritual orphan, the orphan heart, goes all the way back to Genesis. Genesis 1 and 2, God creates Adam in his own image. They are in beautiful relationship. 
Adam and Eve know God the Father. They know God the Creator. They are intimate with Him. They walk with Him in the cool of the day. It is idyllic. It is Eden. <clears throat> Until Adam and Eve believed a lie. And once they did that, what happened to them? Their eyes were open. They recognized they were naked. And they were ashamed. And when did they do next? What did they do next? Not hid, something else. Tried to sow. They tried to cover their shame. They tried to fix it. They tried to take responsibility. They had blown it. They had failed God. They had sinned against God. They had disobeyed the only commandment he gave. Well, one of the commandments he gave them, don't eat from that tree, and they ate from that tree. And so they tried to correct the problem. They tried to fix the problem by sewing leaves together to cover their nakedness, to cover that shame. At that moment, they were alienated from God. They had become God's enemies. They were spiritual orphans through their sinful rebellion. And they opened to the human race, this sin and death that has permeated every part of humanity. And then what happened next? God comes. They hear him coming. And then what do they do? They hide. That's what spiritual orphans do, is we try to cover, but then we're caught. We try to hide. We don't want anybody to see us in our nakedness. We don't want anybody to see us in our brokenness, in our sinful state. We don't want them to, to see who we are, and so we hide. But then God calls them out. Adam, where are you? Come on, Adam. Well, I was naked. Who told you? Who told you? Woman, you gave me. That's what spiritual orphans do. Spiritual orphans can't, because they already are so broken, they can't accept anything, so they have to blame somebody else. What a mess. Adam blames Eve. Eve blames the snake. The snake goes, yeah, baby, I did it. <laughs> he doesn't blame anybody else. Oh, I, I did it. Satan hates God and hates us, created in the image of God. You have a spiritual orphan. You have spiritual orphans there in the Garden of Eden. They're kicked out and they've lost everything. That alienation from God. They were afraid. Prior to that, they never feared God in terms of being afraid of him. They reverenced him, but they never feared him. After that, they were afraid. It says so in the text. And they were afraid. That's what spiritual orphans are. They're afraid. They so desperately want to get back to Eden. They so desperately want to have a relationship with God, but because of their brokenness and their sin, they can't. They have an orphan heart. And here we are, millennia later, and we still have people living with an orphan heart. We still have Christians living with an orphan heart. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but if God gave me the message, then my guess is there's probably a few of you here and a few of you watching here that know what I'm talking about. Pastor, you just read my mail. Pastor, you read my mail. I come to Calvary every week, but I always feel like I'm on the outside looking in. I see other believers, and they look like they belong. They look like they fit, but me, you know, I don't know. I just, I'm just hoping maybe someday it'll change. How do I heal, Pastor, from an orphan heart? Is it just memorize a thousand verses and I'm good? No, well, like I said, I try that. What does it take? Go back to the Garden of Eden. Did the fig leaves work? Did hiding work? Did hiding and hurling work? The only solution was God took animal skins, slayed the animals and took animal skins and covered them for them. They couldn't cover themselves. They couldn't repair the orphan heart. It took God supernaturally providing. And in the wilderness, when God gave Israel the sacrificial system, it was God putting a covering on them. 
for their sin. But it was only temporary. It was a promissory note. It was saying the debt's going to be paid down the road, but for now, this will cover you. Until finally, Jesus, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, hangs on the tree and provides the only sufficient covering that we need to restore us back to God the Father. He took all of the brokenness. He took all the alienation. He took the reality that we are enemies of God. He took all of that in time and space, and heaven and earth met right there. And God covered us so that we can come back to the Father. He made a way so that we can be restored, so that we can have confidence to approach the throne of grace in a time of need. We are now called, it says in Hebrews, to draw near, to draw near to God. It takes God's covering. And when you look in our text in Romans chapter 8, it's the Spirit himself that testifies with our spirit that we're God's children. It's not, I've got to try so hard to figure this out. I've got to try so hard to be able to get this gone. I've got to memorize a thousand verses. I've got to pray an hour a day. I've got to do all these things. I've got to do all of this to convince myself. I remember when I was in college, studying to be a pastor, banging my head against the wall, literally, trying to say, God, I just want to know that you love me. Not just with my mind, I want to know in the fullness of experience that I am loved by you, loved by you, Father. Nothing that I was able to do was able to heal an orphan heart, but God by his Spirit can and does. It's the Spirit of God that will step into our lives and begin that work of healing that work of restoring and many. He is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. It is the spirit of God that comes and takes what Jesus did and makes it real to our heart and to our lives. It's the Holy Spirit that breaks through that orphan spirit and orphan heart and goes right to our spirit and says, you are a child of God. You are not an orphan any longer. You are a child of God. You are a child of the Father in heaven. Maybe that's why the Apostle Paul, after listing all of the incredible blessings that are ours in Jesus Christ in Ephesians 1, he's, gone, he's on a roll. In the original language in which Paul wrote, verses 3 through 14 is one sentence. Try that on Grammarly and see what it does. It'll tell you. It's too long of a sentence if you're typing it. I'm not sure Turabian would be happy with it if you're turning in a paper. Paul can't get the blessings out fast enough. Oh, God's done this and 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 this. And then it's almost like he stops because he, it's almost like he sees the congregation in his mind. Oh, yes, it. Oh. They got kind of dazed looks. I don't think they're getting it. Let me try listing it all again. No, he doesn't do that. Let me tell him to go memorize two scriptures and call me in the morning. No. What does he do? He stops in the middle of his letter. And he says in verse 17, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Paul didn't try to ram the truth down their throats. Paul didn't try to convince them in terms of argumentation. Paul laid out truth, and then he said, Father, you do the rest. Father, I'm praying. Notice, I keep asking. Paul had spent years at Ephesus. He knew the congregation. And so as he's praying, he's probably going through, yeah, I pray for Beth and Chris. Pray for Mary Louise. Pray for Sister Effie. 
He's going through his mind. Oh, God, open their eyes. Open their eyes. God, give them that revelation. Take information, Lord, and make it revelation. Take truth and make it come alive. Let it burst alive in their spirit. A reality that they would know that they know they know the hope to which they've been called. Give them that spirit of revelation, Lord. Father, you know what they've experienced. You know what they've been through. You know that they, they're struggling to understand this. God, you can show them. God, you can open their eyes. And I'm going to keep asking and I'm going to keep praying, Father, that their eyes would be open and that spirit of wisdom and revelation would be given to them so they may be able to understand and see. And then Paul finishes up Revelation, or excuse me, Ephesians chapter 1. And he gets back on with a head of steam again. He gets into chapter 2 and he goes, man, we were a mess. Man, we were a mess. But God, 2-4, but God, who is rich in mercy, has made us alive in Christ Jesus. By grace you're saved. He has lifted you up, raised you up, seated you in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And he gets going. He's like, oh my gosh, by grace you're saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. We're God's workmanship. Oh my God, this is incredible. Remember, this is what you were. Oh, but look at what you are now. Bah, 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 And then chapter 3, oh my gosh, this is mystery. This is what God, no, 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 no. Oh, wait a minute. I see glazed looks again. Better stop. Getting going too fast, too much head of steam. They're missing it again. So he stops. Again, in the middle of his letter, he stops. And in verse 16 of Ephesians 3, I pray, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Father, I just shared with them a whole bunch of new stuff, these church at Ephesus, but I can see glazed looks again. Lord, I pause. Would you give them the power they need to see it? Would you open their eyes? Some of you have labored as spiritual orphans for much of your Christian life. You love Jesus, you know Jesus, and if you died, you go be with Jesus. We're not talking about that. Now, if you don't know Christ at all, and you're watching this or you're in the service, you're not a child of God. You know, I know sometimes our politicians want to tell us, we're all children of God. No, we're not. We're all creations of God, but you're only a child by faith in Jesus Christ. If you're not in Christ, you belong to your father, the devil. That's what Jesus said. Take it up with him. But to those of you who know Jesus, to those of you who have labored in your Christian life, you have sought to be faithful, you have strived and, and worked hard. But this message has resonated with your spirit. This resonated, wow, this is me. He, he, he's, he's talking to me, and I'm not, Jesus is. Father's Day, June 20th, 2021. May this be a day that the Father begins through his spirit to open your eyes to see the hope to which he's called you and the depth, the height, the length and breadth of his love that you might come to see the good, good Father. Daddy, God, is your Father. That you are an orphan no more, but a child of God. Let's pray. So worship team comes up. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, it is you who testify to our spirits that we are children of God. We know that the relationship that we have with you through Jesus Christ 
is the secure foundation upon which all of the Christian life is built. Without it, we will build through dead works, trying to be acceptable. We will look at one another as competitors instead of as brothers and sisters. We will keep people at a distance. We will always be on the outside looking in. That insecure bond affects us when we go through trials so that instead of those trials being used to mature us, they deflate us and defeat us. But when we come to understand that you are a good, good father, perfect in all your ways, then our faith and trust is strengthened when we go through those times because we come to believe you're at work. And so I ask, Lord, on this Father's Day, that the Holy Spirit would open eyes. This isn't just about a feeling. This is a, a revelation of truth that grabs a hold of our hearts or information becomes revelation illuminated by the Spirit so that everything we do flows out of grace and truth in a relationship with you rather than an insecure bond with you. Open our eyes to see that we are orphans no more. We are children of the King, children of the Father in heaven by faith in Jesus Christ because he paid the price and covered us. You're a good, good Father. In Jesus' name.
If you've had or have an orphan's heart, I want you to know you are welcome here at Calvary. We don't just tolerate you. You are welcome here. You are loved here. And one of the ways the Father can reveal the revelation of that Father heart of God is through one another in the body of Christ. We get a chance to be his hands and feet extended as his grace to one another. We get a chance to show the love of the Father to each other. And so, Lord, I pray that in the context of community, that Calvary Assembly would be healthy to grace and truth people. That we don't coddle and just love without truth but we don't beat with just truth without love. But they're brought together redemptively so that people are able to know what the love of the Father is tangibly lived out. And that as your spirit works, not just in us as individuals, but in the context of community, that Lord, we would grow more and more as a body of believers to reflect the Father heart of God to each other, Lord, and to share the love of God through Christ to our community so that they too can become your children and become part of the family. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Um, We're going to be saying goodbye to our folks that are online because we're going to take a few moments for missions moments and receive our offering. And we do that without revealing some of our missionaries. We want to protect them as they travel. Um, But we're glad that you joined us, and hopefully you'll be back again next week. So God bless you, and we'll see you later. A couple of announcements. Please notice in your bulletins, we just want to make sure we have our teams in place.